Rex Lewis. Um, Rex is the next um, presenter. Rex is going to give us an update on the, um, on the livestock markets. Now, Rex, Rex is very experienced in um, livestock and all things marketing. Um, Rex is also a real estate agent. Now, but um, he's also a farmer in his spare time, but um, I believe his wife does most of that. Um, the key, I think, the key attribute of Rex, particularly for this forum and um, our profession, is that Rex is one of the few livestock agents that understands the difference between price and value. Rex is one of the few livestock agents that can really understand the drivers of profit when we're dealing with livestock. And I think when we're talking to our clients, and as John, John was sort of outlining then, we need to really have a feel for profitability because price and value are different things or can be different things. So livestock agents, and I wasn't trying to uh, denigrate livestock agents. Livestock agents are very good at pricing. They understand the market infinitely and they know what an animal's worth on any given day, all right, because that's what they deal in. The key skill that we want in terms of giving advice to clients is what's the value? We know a lamb might be worth $160, but what's that worth to our client? That's always the question, because it might be, that might be good value, even though it seemingly might be cheap for what it is. So I guess that's the issue. So Rex, over to you. Rex is going to give us an update on how things are going, and of course he's got perfect um, foresight, and he'll tell us where they're going. So. Um, I don't know. Right. Oh, uh, you yep, you're on. So, there you go. Thanks. Right, thanks, Ash. Um, just a couple of comments uh, on what John was talking about. I, I love numbers, um, and so the the, uh, the idea that a really efficient farmer can make more money and buy out the less efficient farmer or stock agent or whatever you happen to be, I, I reckon it's great. I love economics. Uh, there is still examples of well below average operators with a lot of money and they still get the land sometimes, so it doesn't always work perfectly. Um, and the other comment, just on what Ash was talking about, the red country around here, um, because I sell a bit of land, I take a bit of interest in that side of it and um, there is a lot of examples in the early 1900s where the fourth, fifth, sixth brother uh, wanted to farm and, and the family farm had been split between the first, second, third and fourth brothers so he got sent out into the desert to the sand plain which was the rubbish which is now Tamar and he wins. So <laughs> technology changes stuff uh, you know and, and that's probably something probably the biggest thing I've learned over my time that stuff that was true when I was 25 is simply not true now so um so my, yeah, my, I've been asked to talk about the, the West Australian sheep market and I'm going to discuss um, the trade side of the market. So lamb, mutton, hog, it's a minor player. Um, and we can have a discussion about the store market, which, which is that market where we're selling breeding stock to graziers, uh, you know, if we have time at the end. But I'll primarily focus on, on trade lamb and mutton, which is the biggest part of our market. Um, and I'll just give you a, sort of a, an overview of what historically is drives our market. Um, now, it's nothing uh, secretive or magical. It, it's, it's just simply, you know, probably what you learn at uni. It's, it's demand, it's supply, and it's the resulting price curve that drives the market in Western Australia. And you, you'll see uh, in my first slide that... It, it, that's your foo or your, your, your pasture growth, typically in Western Australia. You know, we, we get a seasonal break and, and away we go. And of course, you know, that, that curve varies a lot, but, but that's about where it sits. So consequently, demand that, you know, the, the demand or the supply, sorry, of the product we, we produce here is driven by that. Farmers have, uh, over time, um, delivered their lambs onto the ground to take advantage of increasing free, if you like, feed. Um, and so our major supply, um, uh, and you'll have to forgive me, uh, I've got a dot for the price curve there and it's, a, it's actually a, a solid line, which I'd like to blame me PA for, but it's my fault. Um, so farmers have uh, dropped their lambs um, in, in that 
April really to July period. There's a few people outside either side of it, and they've done that so that the lamb is taking advantage of increasing pasture growth in Western Australia. So consequently, the green line, we get increasing supply of lamb during that period in Western Australia. And as a result of increasing supply, as you know, the top line, the price decreases. That's as pretty well as simple as it is. Um, we'll talk about the mutton market as we go, but of course the mutton market is is dependent on when you're dropping your lamb. So when mutton, old ewes primarily, and, and in the old days perhaps more weathers are available. So, um, you know, the the um, you know the, it's not anything. You don't need to read too much into it. It's pretty simple. There's a lot of lambs typically available in Western Australia in the spring and the price generally drops. That's what goes on. So um, uh, I'm going to talk to you from July on, right? So we're just going to go through the months of the year and I'll tell you approximately where we're at at each month and some of the intricacies of what's going on in that particular month. Um, now, this is changing. The, the, what I'm going to talk to you about today is what's been going on for the 30 years of my career. Two years ago, definitely last year, and quite obviously this, this year, we're probably moving to a different paradigm, I think, as a result of lack of supply and also increased demand. So July, typically July is a month where the price is holding for lamb and holding for mutton and possibly increasing, and that's just simply due to lack of supply. Um, you know, in, in June or in July in the mutton side of things, there's very little old ewes available because they're either dropping lambs, lactating, um, so, so they're not available for sale. So you get a lack of supply, you get a spike in the price. It's the lowest, July is the lowest supply month of the year typically. Um, you know, in a good year, when you've dropped lambs in March, they may be ready for slaughter in July if you've got a good year. But typically, we don't have any new seasons lamb available at that time of the year. Um, you, you've got cold, wet conditions and you've got slow growth. If they've been dropped any later than March, April, they're just simply not ready. They're not heavy enough to meet the criteria for the, for the killing market in Western Australia. I'll just expand on that a little. The, the domestic killing market in Western Australia, you, you know, typically they want an 18 kilo dress weight carcass. When they're desperate, 18 turns into 16 all of a sudden and it's no problem. But, but normally below 18, you're getting a price discount. We don't have a hell of a lot of uh, lamb exported out of Western Australia in comparison to other states because of our geographical position on the, on the globe. And, and aside from that, Export lamb generally needs to be quite a lot heavier. So they want 30 kilo carcasses. So you're just having them ready new seasons in July is nearly impossible to do. So we're relying on the domestic trade and, and we need a certain weight. So, so July, pretty hard to have new seasons lambs available. And if you think about that, the, the lambs from the year before have been sold, you know, to, to run them to drop them the previous year and run them all the way to July is a costly exercise uh, and, and it's, it's difficult. Um, the, the, the big players in the market, that, that, you know, Walsh's Whamco, that, that require a lot of lamb, you know, that want 10 to 20,000 lambs every week to slaughter, they've recognised this and they've gone into feedlot operations. They might have bought their own feedlot or well, they may well have employed, you know, done a deal with, with an ash herb and, 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 you know, you produce, you go and feed like 25,000 lambs for me and have them ready in July. So they have tried to fill their gaps, July is one of them, with, with lamb that is on feedlot and prepared. Part of our job is to, is to try and ascertain how much of that lamb is on the market and and then how much they buy and how much then is going to be ready at a certain period of time, so maybe July. So whilst I'm thinking July is a, a, 
a great month to be selling lamb. I've got to be careful that, you know, Walsh's don't have 35,000 lambs on feed ready for July and all of a sudden the demand drops away because they don't need it. They don't need to go to the market and that'll drop the price off a bit. So it's just something we monitor. The other thing that goes on in July is the bigger abattoirs, or, well, the big ones and the small ones, quite often use that month to shut for maintenance. Most of them, not all of them, but most of them need a two, three, four, five-week period to shut for maintenance. And they'll use July typically because they have no stock to buy. So if you're going to stop, if you're going to stop production, you might as well do it when you've got lack of supply. So that can have an effect in July as well. That if they disappear out of the market, one of the big players, it can, not always, but it can have an effect. So, so great month to be selling, a couple of things to look at. Oops, excuse me. August through to November, it, it's pretty basic stuff. You know, you've got increasing lamb supply and you've generally got a slide in the price. Um, and again, with, with um, yeah, that, that, that supply generally peaks in November in Western Australia. Up our way, we're done and dusted by November. All our lambs are gone, our new season's lambs. But down south where the numbers are, and they've still got green feed, you generally got a peak in supply of lamb in November. And, and that's generally about the bottom of your lamb price, typically, because, because of that. Not to say that selling a lamb in November for 130 bucks is not profitable. <laughs> because it may well be, because there's no feed costs involved. That's a, that's a different argument. But typically, most farmers and most real estate stock agents want to get the high prices. We do, because we get 5% of it, so the higher the better. But, but it may well be profitable to, to produce all your lambs and, and unload them in November right at the bottom of the market. That may be more profitable given stocking rate. That's a whole other argument, which, which we basically, in our game, leave to you guys. But that will result generally in the bottom of the market in, in November. Again, mutton price is in, mutton um, supply is increasing. Again, not rocket science. The lambs get waned. Those mutton that are not suitable for breeding next year get sold or shorn and sold. So the, pro, the supply of mutton starts to shift up and the price starts to shift down. Again, it's just not rocket science. If you think about it logically, that's going to happen. Um, the age-old thing with lamb, it, it, you know, you might have a, a 19 kilo dress weight lamb, and, and the cocky says, "Well, I've got heaps of feed. What I'll do is I'll, I'll hang on to it, and, and I'll turn it into a 22 kilo lamb, and wow, I'm going to make more money." Now, in the current environment, if the price of lamb is seven bucks a kilo, and your lambs are putting on 200 grams a day, which you should be able to do better than that, but if that's about where you are, and the price is dropping 25 to 20. 20 to 25 cents per week because they're getting more supply. You are going nowhere. The price of your lamb's flatlining. You're getting a heavier lamb, well done, but you're, you're dropping off cents per kilo, so it's generally flatlining. And typically over my time, I've found sell the lamb. As soon as it's ready in the spring, bowl it over. I don't care how much feed you've got. Knock that sheep over and move on because... It, by November, you've gained very little price. You might as well conserve your dry feed for your ewes or whatever you're going to do. At the end of the talk, we'll, we'll discuss that because I might have to change my view on that, the way this market's going. Um, um, right, yep. Um, beautiful. December, January, prices increasing. Limited lamb supply, or less lamb supply because we've sold a heap in the spring. And also, it's cockies are harvesting and they're holidaying. And they're not good at doing two things at once because they're mostly blokes. And that's the truth of it. You, you will get, almost every year, you'll get a price spike at that time of the year. And, you know, we'll draft lambs on Boxing Day because we might be getting 20, 30 cents a kilo extra. Um, it, so that time of the year is a great time to sell, but you've got to get off your header and you've got to come home from Bustleton to do it. And that's primarily what is going on. Again, the feedlotters try and fill that with, 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 sheep, that, with sheep that they've fed lot. But, um, and, and the other lambs that we've shorn late are on the stubbles, but they just haven't reached the target weight, so they're not ready. So typically that time of the year is a ripping time to sell. 
February, you know, on the, on the 4th or 5th of February, if you're a stock agent, your phone starts ringing. Hey, go on a moment for holidays, want to sell some lamb. And it just happens in a three to four, five day period. And the price of lamb, uh, the supply of lamb spikes. And, um, and, the, and you can get a dip in price in February. It can be a bit of a funny month. Still good value, but, but you get a, a bit of a dip because of it. And March typically is a, is a, is a pretty good month. It holds or increases in March. And for the similar reason in April, cockies unloading prior to cropping. Right, I've done what I can with these lambs. Rex, get them off the place. They've got to go because I'm going to run them over with my tractor. And again, you get an increase in supply and you can get a dip in price. It's just something to be mindful of. May to June, uh, you know, is the same story. It's, it's happy days. You've got to be careful of feedlotters filling the gaps. But May to June... Um, there's not as many lambs around. Cockies are all driving tractors, so they don't want to draft any sheep and deliver any. Um, and you generally got an increasing uh, a price through that period. Um, the other markets in Western Australia, you know, live sheep really have, have come back by a third. We were delivering nearly 1.8 million sheep in, in 17, and we, do, we did about 600,000 in the 2021 year. So that market has shrunk due to the probably our social, uh, commu- uh, social licence uh, taken off us. You know, the community's not keen on live export and we've had to... It, it, it's made it more difficult to do it. Air freight sheep is almost non-existent these days simply because of COVID. There's less aeroplanes. So I think the price of air freight lambs, five bucks a kilo to go up into, the, into Asia and I think it's about 15 at the moment. You just simply can't buy them and freight them up there. So that, that's got rid of those two markets or heavily reduced them. Fortunately for us... Given the demand for red meat globally, the, the, the feedlotting industry has exploded. And, and, and in Western Australia, we are delivering, you know, one feedlotter in, in South Australia bought 80,000 lambs out of Western Australia last year and freighted them over there and fed lot them, paid our prices here which some of our feedlotters would not pay because it wasn't profitable, but he paid the price. He freighted them across the Nullarbor Plain. He fed lot them, and we do a lot of business with the bloke. He had a really profitable year. So we've been fortunate that these guys have stepped into that breach and taken those lambs from 32 or 3 kilos through to about 43 or 4 uh, that, that we, we haven't finished, and, and, um, and they've taken them east. And there's more and more of these guys getting going in Western Australia too. So that's a real growing market. And it's, a, it's actually, in my view, in a lot of cases, a very profitable market for the farmer. Sometimes he doesn't want to take that. He wants to say, I've got 220 for my lambs. But, but sometimes 140 bucks on the farm for a big heap of merle and no feed, in my view, is very profitable. But that's up to the farmer. You know, we're working for him. Um, I just looked these figures up on Google. I suppose they're true. Uh, Because, you know, it's not something I follow, but very little, even as little as, you know, 2,000, there's very little sheep mate going into China and there's a heap of it going in there now. The the thing that got me was the the lamb consumption per head, per kilos per person per annum in China is about four kilos or sheep, yeah, lamb consumption, sorry. In the US it's 26. If, if China continues West, this westernisation, which they're going to, that market is, is mind-boggling, really. Um, so uh, our sheep flock, as everyone knows, is, is back to about a third, and we've got an increase this year, supposedly. They reckon we might have a 6% increase. So we've got increased supply, uh, increased um, demand, we've, and, and expected even higher increased demand. We've got a much lower supply. It, it looks to be pretty happy days. Um, the, the risks are that 65% of our product goes into the US and China. That's a lot of eggs in one basket, in my view. Um, and, and we are really relying on that frozen chilled market, not the live export and air freight market, which we turn, talked about. The other real risk is canola. Because if, if I'm a cocky and I'm looking at canola and wondering whether I'll drop out my sheep and get rid of them, Arguably, that'll just reduce supply more and probably the price will go up, but yeah, that's, that's a whole different argument. Th- this is the important thing. If you see that red line, that's price this year 
and a bit of last year, right? So, so normally your black line, that, that'll decrease 15 to 25% from the 1st of August to the mid-November pretty well every year. And this year it's bloody nearly flatlining. And that is just simply supply and demand. There's nothing fancy about it. So, so where you couldn't hold lambs and put weight on them, you now can with that, possibly you can with that free feed in the paddock. And this is a relation of, it's just simply in my view, a lack of, in my view, Bron, see, I got out of that, um, it, it is simply a lack of supply and hell of a lot of demand. So we might have a completely changing market in Western Australia. Um, and, and that's something we've got to monitor. I think possibly this big high and low thing, is that I think the price curve is going to flatten out a lot. Um, and, and actually, that'll make guys like me less, less needed, probably, you know, because it'll be easier to market your sheep because, it, because the curve will be flatter. Feed lotters will be feeding into the, into the gaps and the lack of supply is, is so severe and the increased demand, we're, get, we're going to have high demand all year. Our job is to... Our job really is to package up 50,000 lambs out of my area and go to a supplier and go, well, I need 40 cents a kilo more, which will cover my client's um, commission, and I'll guarantee you 50,000 lamb, and that'll be our job. And, and, you know, all stock agents, but, you know, maybe even a role that consultants can take. So um, that's it. Yeah, if you want to talk the store market, if you've got any other questions. Thank you, Thanks, Rex. We've got, uh, got a fair bit of time for questions. So, um, any questions? Um, anyone? Ed, thank you. Ed Riggle. Uh, how much of that, how much of the impact of trucks or them getting their head around just chucking lambs to the east? Is that a big deal? Yeah, big I, thing? yeah, definitely. I reckon it's had a, a big effect. About five years ago, we started trucking ewes to the eastern states. Uh, to, to, uh, just an agent over there we got to know, and it was a it was a big thing. It was there was a lot of stress involved. Um, there's a lot of um, discussion and effort gone into um, animal welfare. Like, how are we going to do this without killing fifty of them? Um, and then also, these guys do not look at the animals, and th so that's that's used. But it's also feedlot animals. So when they get them there. If my description's incorrect, you know, who's writing the check out for that? So there was a lot of that involved. It was only five years ago. Now, it just happens. We, we've, we've got some outs, we've got really good transport industry, like the, most of them are really good operators. Uh, we are dropping at Nundrew now, so we used to just run the truck all the way through. So the sheep could be standing on the truck for 30 odd hours. Now they'll do a 12 or 14 hour stint. They'll, They'll drop off at Nundrew. They'll go on to feed and water overnight and electrolytes at certain times of the year. And then the, the, the truck from the east meets them, meets that mob the next morning and off they go again. So just a little stat. The, I think the, the feedlot, one, one of the feedlotters we deliver into was, was getting a flat line growth for six to ten days. When, the, when we trucked them straight through, he's getting got the lamb home, no growth for six to ten days and an 8 to 9% weight loss on the trip. When we started dropping at Nundrew, he was getting weight gain from day one and getting a 6% drop, weight loss drop on the way over. When you're feedlotting numbers or everything, and it's all small margins, so that for him was incredible. So, so we have got it down pat. Um, you know, it, it's, it, my view, we're doing a ripping job. We, we get very few deaths. We figured out how to truck use. We figured out how to truck big heavy use. Trans Plus last year did um, two loads a day every day of the year to the east and no disasters. So. Mm. Chris. Yeah, Rex, um, the increase in trans and loaded land before all this, I mean, that's going to have uh, an impact on the store market, and particularly in the east and central east and west coast. Are you seeing that trend to loaded land increasing as well? Um, you probably you, the answer is probably no um, in the wheat belt because um, most guys see their sheep as a minor enterprise. Um, 
I, you know, I am getting head around July lambing, and, and I've, you know, ten years ago I, I don't know about it, and now I, I, I think I'm a fan of it. So it's slow, and, and yes, uh, we, we're moving that way, but largely it's a small part of their enterprise. So we've always dropped them in uh, April, and that'll do. Um, you know, and I, and I can't speak for down south, but I'd say down there it's sort of a no-brainer, particularly the season's a little longer than ours. Um, so um, that will give us some more summer lambs. And we, over a 30-year period, we used to deliver maybe 80% of our lambs in the spring, and we didn't carry any in the summer, and, and now we're about 40, 60. Most of our lambs, most of our lambs go into the summer. So I guess we have gone that way, but it's not a it's not a savage trend that way, Chris. No. Thanks, Rex. Stacey. Um, are you finding that with the change in the definition of labs of the two two system now? Um, are you finding that that's actually affecting price trends as well? Um, I haven't noticed it, but but I reckon it would be. But given that the demand is so high and the supply is so short, we've got ripping prices anyway, so it's hard to pick how much it's had an effect. I wasn't a massive fan of it when it came out, to be honest, because of uh, two reasons. One is it's a very subjective measurement. I pop the mouth open and go, yeah, no way, that's an even wear. And the guy killing it opens it up and calls it a hogget. Well, it's a hogget. Doesn't matter what I think. The other system was really good. If it's broken the gum, it's pretty easy. Um, but also, um, it, I saw it as giving a hogget supply in, um, you know, in May, June, July, to the butcher, which he didn't have before, which was going to reduce the price for those particular farmers that bred their lambs for early delivery, and I thought it actually might not be a good thing for those particular blokes. But I think at the end of the day, supply is so short, uh, an extra few doesn't sort of really matter. Um, and, and, yeah, I must admit, for some of our guys with later merinos and we're sort of looking at them, what are we going to do, and pop their mouths open and... Still getting 200 bucks for them in this year in, in late August. Yeah, just to give you an idea, in the old days, you, you could not deliver a merino sucker to a butcher. He wouldn't take it. They're not good enough, apparently. Um, you certainly couldn't deliver old seasons lamb past, past about the 8th of, uh, of August. And last week, we sent a truck down with Sean Merino new seasons lamb on it, some crossbreds and some old seasons. Can you fit these in? Yes, I can. Yeah, all of a sudden, um, if it's a lamb, they're happy. So, and we're 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 fortunate in the you know the twenty years of my career, they had to stick really the butchers. You you had to be you had to plan, you had to know when you had sheep coming up and make it all work. There's a few years in the middle there where it's a bit of whatever. And at the moment, the the farmer's got the stick. If you've got supply of sheep and you can deliver the product they want, draft it to what they want, you will get a premium. Yeah, they'll pay. It. No, I, I agree with you. It's definitely if they could get away with it now, they wouldn't. They'd find a reason to discount your merinos, and 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 some big processes still have two schedules: one for merino, one for crossbred. Um, the, the, the biggest process that we use, we've been selling in merinos at the same price as crossbeds for 20 years, but you've got to draft them right. Yeah. So, yes, genetics has improved. We haven't got those big, long, sort of strippy bodies. I don't know, that's not a good word for it, but long, lean bodies, you know, whereas a vegan, we are producing a better merino carcass than we were. There's no doubt about that. Um, so that's definitely had an effect, but but you, you, even those poorer bodies, if you like, um, you, you can still um, you, you can still draft and get them right. You might leave a few behind, but yeah. So I think the breeding's definitely had an effect. We've got way better. Um, you know, we're measuring eye muscle and merinos. Well, 25 years ago, we we're just talking about spring and rib or something. So. <laughs> Rex, thank you. Your experience and knowledge is, is ex always welcome. Um, and just remember, just remember, um, people like Rex, um, he touched on it several times, um, it's volume for a low cost. 
Agriculture is all about producing volume for a low cost. And when Rex talks store lands, that's exactly what it is. High volume, low cost, that's where the money is. That's, that's certainly my view, and um, I know Rex sort of concurs. So, Rex, as always, thank you.